Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. So today I want to be talking to you about the most classic that I like. So, sorry I'm a little out of breath. <laughs> in my last video, I talked about Nectar and the Sieve. I'm kind of reading classics right now, that's what I'm into. And I just finished Out of Africa by Isaac Denison. So the reason why I had read this book is because, like I kind of talked about in a few videos ago, I was reading Eve Babbitt's, which I don't know if people would consider Eve's Hollywood a classic. I don't know if it's old enough yet. It came out in 1973? Wait, but it was maybe, was it about the 60s and it came out? Whatever. It came out in the latter half of the 20th century. But I really, really liked that book. And in that book, there was a chapter where she discussed some of the books that she read that were pretty formative to her. And this was one of them. And so Nectar and the Sieve was one of them. This was one of them. And also Green Mansions, which I'm reading right now, also was one of them. I don't really like Green Mansions. I don't like the way that it's written. It's even more, it's even older than these are. This one is from 19, let's see. This one is from 1937. I think Nectar and the Sieve was like 1951, 1952. And, but I think Green Mansions is like 18 something. And I, I don't like the way that that's written. But about this book. So I have sort of mixed feelings about this book in the sense that I think generally it's well written. Like it's not a book that's hard to read. The style is nice. It's poetic. The prose is very strong. I think from a content perspective, what you can kind of expect from this book is it's like the intersection between like girl boss and white man's burden that's how i would describe this she has this sort of casual racism that you would expect from someone who's living as a european pioneer in east africa but at the same time tries to incorporate it with compassion so it's not like she's constantly um uh berating the the native people of kenya but and, and even you sort of see the contrast between her form of racism versus like the belgians so there's this scene in a, in the book where she's coming on a ship she had gone to europe for like you know a month or whatever to go visit whatever and she's coming back and she's talking to this belgian guy and the belgian guy is being like really racist and she's with this british guy and she's like yo like what is this dude's problem like why <laughs> what is he talking <laughs> like the belgian guy was just being like like very aggressive like we need to teach those blacks and we need to do this and we need to do that and her and the english guy are like bro like chill like <laughs> what so <laughs> You see that there is sort of gradations and levels, but the majority of this book is basically her being a girl boss on her coffee plantation, trying to make her company work, but eventually it doesn't work out, and like shooting animals and shooting lions and being like, yeah, I had to kill these fucking lions because they ate my cow. Um, I see why this book is so popular, because it definitely is like, it feels like it feels like a romantic fever dream of what it would be like to start a new life and try to break out into your own in a foreign place. And if you didn't have the slightest idea of what colonialism and specifically what British colonialism was like and is, I'm sure you would love this book and just think it's kind of like a meandering romantic story about life on a frontier. But if you have any idea about what the British actually had to do, and, or, and she's not British, she's Danish. I think that also plays into it because it's kind of like she's just showing up and she's just like, well, you know, the British, they're the government here, they do that. So she's also considering herself sort of an outsider as far as the colonial regime because she's not British. But there's, um, God, I lost my train of thought. Oh yeah, if you have any idea of what the British actually had to do to colonize Africa, this book, you can see everything that gets left out. There's only a few times where she actually touches on the hardships that the natives face. Um, one of them is in a story she tells about this man who kills one of his, a white man who kills one of his black servants in the, like, the sort of brutal way that he murders them in the trial. And then another is kind of whenever she gets to the end and she, spoiler, she has to sell the farm in the end. And when she gets to the end, she talks about how she has to negotiate with the government to try to find a new place for basically her serfs 
on the farm to for them to have a new place to live since she sold the farm and they're gonna turn it into something else now she has to like negotiate with them to try to find a place to live and she talks about the relationships with them but pretty much all the black people in this book are kind of like just like flat one-dimensional except for her kind of like right-hand man named Farah who I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right but F-A-R-A-H and he's Somalian so the Somalian pronunciation of that but with Farah he is the only one who sort of gets a little bit of characterization, gets a little bit, oh, and also um, Kamante, Kamante or Kamane, his name. Um, actually, wait, I can look. Yeah, Kamante. Kamante and Farah get a little bit of characterization. They get story, they're kind of more dynamic characters, um, but everybody else is just kind of in the background and it's mostly just about her being a girl boss on the African frontier. I liked it as a, as a classic, I would, tell someone to read this because you'll start to understand the style and you'll start to understand the mood of this era of this colonial era like white man's burden like this is a really good book to read and I think also too this can be sort of like a greater allegory there was a story that came out in the news the other day the, the news the, a story that I saw on Instagram that I think like Diet Prada had posted or something of some like Upper East Side uh, you know white girl boss woman who was like oh I didn't know I was rich until coronavirus and then I realized oh actually I've been in private school private universities summer in the Hamptons da -da 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 and I didn't even realize like what the level of privilege and class status that I had until like last week and so everybody's like roasting her in the comments like you like how the fuck did you not know I think this is kind of like that except <laughs> this is the version without instagram so instead of it being <laughs> instead of her writing out like a blog post about it on the cut isaac dennison wrote a whole fucking novel about it just being totally out of touch with reality like there is no world outside of the world of just exactly what i'm creating here on this farm in kenya and there are parts of it that play into it there are servants that come and go there is my lover who comes and goes there's europeans here there's white people here there's all types of different arabs indians yada 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 but like my world is about me and about what i'm building and what i'm doing and this is the sort of center of the universe in a lot of ways um and so that's kind of exasperating i think from an american perspective it's interesting because americans generally when they think of africa and this is just my opinion like i think when americans think of africa they think of west africa nigeria ghana um senegal uh cameroon like west african culture is the american ideal of africa and i think that's for obviously because of the atlantic slave trade um in the modern times more now because media that comes from africa that gets popular in america mostly comes from west africa whether it's music movies um you know whatever whatever and then also too because of immigrant populations i would say generally at least in my experience there's like more west africans in america than eastern africans or southern africans or even north africans so that culture has sort of become the most well-known one and so this was interesting for me to start to get a little bit of insight into east african culture and there i am not saying that because i think this is an a accurate representation of history or of culture of anything like that but just a few things that were mentioned when she talks about those characters makes me interested to go find more information about those cultures and learn about them and read about them from people that are actually from there not from her obviously because i don't really think you can trust really any type of colonial history written by the colonizers like you can't really trust that but you the only thing you can read them for is to read what they say their experience was like and that's really kind of all you can take it for as far as like historical accuracy truth like even in this book you can see all the parts that they glaze over like there's even this one thing called and i'm not sure if i'm pronouncing it right but it's called a nagoma n-g-o-m-a and it's basically like a dance a dance ceremony ritual type thing the way it's described here is you do it to celebrate something if there's a major event all the different tribes come together and they do this kind of big dance ceremony i would i would to give you like a reference to me the way it's described here it kind of sounds like a powwow if you're familiar with like native american powwows it's it's kind of like that and so at some point the colonial government bans it they bans them they ban them 
and she never goes into why they're banned what was the purpose of them banning them she talks about how one time the serfs that live on her a plantation were arrested because they were having a uh, nagoma and the one of the the european wives of a commander like didn't like it and could hear it from five miles away and so had them all arrested um and so they're outlawed and then at the end they try to do one for like you know just old time's sake and the government comes in and says no you can't do this you can't have this dance ceremony here it's like why okay well we know why because you know colonial theory is you have to kill the culture you have to destroy the rituals that bond the communities together you have to break down the factions and the connections to heritage so that people will then accept the new reality of like colonial dominance but she doesn't talk about that she just goes oh then they said we couldn't do it because it's illegal okay move on <laughs> so yeah i think it's an interesting book it's a well-written book if you're from East Africa or you're even just familiar with the Kenyan the colonialism that happened in Kenya or in East Africa in general that it will probably not be as interesting to you as it was to me because I'm just not that knowledgeable on the topic I actually wrote a paper my freshman year of college about water rights in Kenya um, and about slum cartels or not slum cartels utility cartels in slums in the different slums of Nairobi and how they came to be and a big part of that paper was me discussing the ways that when the colonists came in they kept saying oh well, we're building infrastructure we're building infrastructure you know we just need to civilize you know this area but the way that they built it was they just built the infrastructure and in where the white people lived right and so then once colonialism was over you had this sort of middle class because the way that colonialism works is that it doesn't work alone right you have to create a new class status and then gain loyalty from the people that you've lifted up in this in this new fake society right that you've built so those people moved into the areas that the white people left and then the infrastructure was neglected and that's sort of what creates the groundwork for slum cartels to exist because the water infrastructure is not there the zoning is not proper the way that they built infrastructure was just building it around themselves and then not doing not doing what they said they were doing doing what they wanted to do and that created this huge problem that made it so that the problems that exist now could exist okay all of that to say i had sort of an idea of what this was like um and so you'll see how easily they just move past it and and you know try to not necessarily pretend it's not happening but just think of it as like the background when for everybody else this is in the foreground <laughs> the act of colonizing the impact of colonizing the destruction of culture that is a lot of people's main aim main goal that is the big power struggle in the center of their lives but for her the big power struggle is how can i keep my coffee plantation going and that lets you know how far removed from reality she was because what like what <laughs> Fuck your coffee plantation. Um, I think I'm going to watch the movie now just because I want to see how they adapted it. This is definitely a 20th century piece of literature in its style. It's not innovative at all, which is not necessarily a bad thing, but it's exactly kind of what you expect. I enjoyed it. It was long. Some parts were fast moving. Some parts were slow. She tended, in some parts, the, the chapters were really short. They were more like sections, I would say. The sections were really short, I moved through faster. But when she would spend a long time, like on one thing in one chapter, I found myself going slower and slower. Um, it's about 400 pages, and I think it took me about a week and a half to read it, because I was kind of picking it up, putting it down, reading it before bed, falling asleep sometimes when I was reading it. Um, and overall, I'll give it three stars. I'll give it three stars on Goodreads. Um, I wouldn't recommend this to someone who has any knowledge about East Africa, colonization, et cetera, et cetera, unless they specifically wanted to get a perspective of someone who was white and living in the colony. If that was the specific perspective that they were trying to learn more about, the perspective of the pioneer, quote unquote, colonizer, I would recommend to them this book because I do think if you're looking for that perspective, this is a good book to read. If you're looking to learn about East Africa, European colonization, et cetera, et cetera, I would say this is much lower. This is maybe like 
a third or fourth tier book to read because it really doesn't address anything except for her own life and her own thing. And it sort of mentions the society tangentially. And so you can kind of get an idea of how did a pioneer who, every pioneer is active and engaging in the colonization, but a pioneer whose main goal wasn't, who like wasn't a part of the government, who was just one of the people that moved there, what was their life like? this would be an interesting account um, to read because it's well written and it is thorough about her life, but literally about nothing else. <sighs> yeah, so that's my review. If you've read this book, comment below what you thought about it. Follow me on Goodreads and have a good day. Okay. Aloha and ciao. I'll see you in the next video.